Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is DJ Taro, and I'm honored today to speak to the legendary, the iconic, Idris Abdul Karim. Thank thanks you. for joining us. Thank you so much, Jim. It's, uh, so we're having a conversation that's in my head I was supposed to have with you in the last five to six years, but I'm happy that you're here now. Good. I want to have your take on a number of issues and, you know, just indulge me. First, with the success of Afrobeats, you know, in the last, you know, three to four years, that we had our Afrobeats entertainers become world stars as opposed to just Nigerian stars. How does that make you feel, one, as, as a consumer of Nigerian music, and then two, as a pioneer who was at the beginning of this thing that we are now enjoying? Uh, it's a beautiful thing, you know. Um, I remember back then, you know, not everybody would like to listen to the new generation song, which is called Afrobeat now. We used to call it Afro hip hop back then, you know. But to God be the glory with the help of people like Kenny Ogunbe, D1, Chris Oboti, a couple of other people in the industry who gave their platform for hip hop to become what it's Afrobeat today. We have the likes of David Doe, Bonham Boy, Whiskey, and all that. The revolution that actually led to that was basically what happened between me and 50 Cent. Most times, Nigerians through the multinationals and even the government don't appreciate their own. You know, you see a multinational try to sell their products with our music, but they don't respect our artists. I can categorically tell you that back then, when 50 Cent was invited to Nigeria, I remember how Nigerian artists were chased from the backstage just because 50 Cent wanted to come to backstage. So what is the essence of you inviting 50 Cent from America to come to Nigeria and perform alongside with our own artist when you're supposed to allow them to, you know, meet and greet and get to understand how the industry works, how American business work and all that. But you rather chase your own artists and treat them like animals. 2004, right? The American rapper 50 Cent was invited to Nigeria to have a concert, at four city concerts, right? That's right. And then they had done the first one that's right. And then the second one, the artist and everybody was supposed to board. And the news that we heard was Idris done the 550 Cent. And it became this huge deal that 50 Cent had to cut the show short and then moved. I've heard the game, I'm young Buck, a number of other people tell the story from their own perspective. One of the most craziest experiences that I've had, Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria. We was on a plane. We was on one plane. We had chartered this one big plane for everybody who's on the whole entire show. One of the guys felt like we were sitting in, 50 was sitting in his seat, right? And the guy had, you know, made a big scene like, yo, yo. And security was like telling them, yo, you sitting in 50 seat, chill, can you get up or whatever, whatever not. So the security kind of probably, you know, took it as if, he finna, yo, bro, what's going on? So he <laughs> yeah. grabbed him, roughed him up, and, you know, like, yo, man, hold on, and walked him on up off the plane. I don't know who that dude was. <laughs> what happened, man? We're on the airplane yeah. runway about to take off. All of a sudden, I just see one, it's like a movie. I just see a dude standing in the middle of the runway, walking towards the plane while what? the plane is taking off. Man, guess what the plane did? Stop. They didn't necessarily know who Idris was. Because there was no, like you said, there was no mingling between the artists at the time. But they knew that there was, this was a guy that, number one, was buff. You know that he wasn't a pushover. And then this guy was visibly angry. And they just, you know, they were afraid for their life. But of course, we know that that wasn't what it was supposed to be. But I've read 50 Cent's book, right? And 50 says he was offered $4 million to do that show. How much were you paid? Um, the other people on, on the roster, did they get as much as you? not to now compare with the $4 million that 50 got. In 2004, I was in Germany with my crew, and um, I was invited to perform alongside with 50 Cent. You know, that was uh, a month after Wyclef King through Guinness, you know. And we know it was a marketing strategy between the two multinationals. So I told them that, listen, if you're inviting me to play alongside with 50 Cent, whatever it is that you're giving 50 Cent, that's what you're going to give me. If you're giving 50 cents an executive room in any seven-star hotel, I want my room to be opposite 50 cents. If you're giving 50 cents 25 bibs, you must give me 25 bibs. Right. If you're giving 50 cents 25 carton of crystal, Dompria, whatever it is that you're giving 50 cents, I want the same. Because Nigerians are the one buying the shares. 
Nigerians are the ones drinking the beers. And it is our music that you're using to sell your products without royalties. I was the highest paid artist on that show. I got 1.5 million Naira per show for the first time than an artist was going to be paid that much. And it was six shows. I told them that whatever it is you're giving 50 cents, that's what you're going to give me. And they said, okay, no problem. We have a, we have a deal. Waited for them to put the rights up together so I can sign. They never did. You know, but they credited my account. Right. You know, just normal Nigerian style, you know, believing that, okay, you know, he will come for the show and all that. So, well, as a street boy, I had an uh, agreement with you. I stand by my agreement. The first show was at the TBS. So I was at the backstage with my crew, E-Money, KC, Ayani Marshall, Tony One Week. You know, that the show game, everybody was at backstage. And all of a sudden, the security came and said, you all have to leave the backstage. And they created one canopy. There was no AC in the canopy. And they now pushed all Nigerian artists. You needed to see that day, man. Treated Nigerian artists like animals. And I felt like, no, man, this is not going to happen to me. It was 50 cent security that was leading the Nigerians' security. We're like, hey, you, what are you doing at the backstage? You got to get the F out of that sleep. I was like, excuse me, who are you, man? I don't know who you are. So yeah, 50 Cent is coming back. Say, so why should I leave? I'm performing along 50 Cent, you know? So why should I leave? I'm Idris Abdul Karim. What's the problem? And it was like, no, we don't want anybody. I said, you, you can't do nothing. I'm staying right here. So he went back to the organizer, and the organizer was like, who? So he said, ah, no, 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 leave him alone. Don't go there, you know? They knew exactly what they were so doing. So you already pressed at that point, like, why are you treating us like this? That's what's up. So this was at the Lagos show. It happened at the Lagos right. show, at right. TBS, right. you know, right here. A lot of the Nigerian artists had to call these multinationals and I begged them to be on bill right. for the show. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So I was the highest paid at that moment. You know, so I said, no, man, I ain't leaving. So 50 Cent came, you know, with his crew and all that, you know, and they went on stage and performed and it sprayed 100 Naira notes, new hundred Naira notes, you know, in the crowd, and the right. crowd thought it was dollars, dollars, you know. Funny enough, some stories that you don't know is that approximately about five people died that night. The Nigerian bureaus covered it up. People were raped, phones were stolen, and they covered it up with the press. So basically, you know, got to the airport around 8 o'clock, waited for 50 Cent and his crew for almost two hours, that the minute. And um, they finally came. I was seated on the business class and walk up to me and said, yeah, you got to get the fuck out of that seat. That's 50 Cent seat. And I was like, excuse me, we don't speak fucking Africa. I don't know what fuck is all about. My name is Idris Abdul Karim. I sold 4.6 million copies in a pirated country. Why don't you come tell me how the American market works? The reason why we're all happy you're here is because we want to learn from you. You know, get to know you and learn how the American market works. And he went back downstairs to speak with the organizer. I was watching the organizers and they were like, you know, they don't know. You know, so he came back and said, yo, we just spoke with the organizer. And they said they don't fucking know who you are before I know what's up, man. They attacked me. So the security kind of probably, you know, took it as if, he finna, yo, bro, what's going on? So he <laughs> yeah. grabbed him, roughed him up, and, you know, like, yo, man, hold on, and walked him on up off the plane. About 12 of them, they attacked me. Then my boys came from the economic class, Soso, Malu, everybody, you know, to come and, you know? And meanwhile, Nigerian artists were there. They were all like, everybody was so oh, like while, while they were coming in, a lot of them were even saying that it's into the do, with him being problem set. To the domain, why they were not on, on, on the bill of the show, they were called to beg to be on the show. Right. So, with the slave mentality is still, yeah. you know, my guy rescued me, and uh, funny enough, DJT, right. if you remember, DJT yeah, was recording mm -hmm. everything that happened, how they attacked me. DJT has he, has, he has the footage, you know. So he kept it. And um, immediately that happened, you know, I just went to the door and jammed the door, you know, and the pilot was like, oh, 
guys, I'm not going anywhere. I don't know what the hell is going on. And this, and I was like, yo, Fiti, I'm performing alongside with you and you disrespect me. I could have been in America and do the same to you. Right. I know what would have happened. You know what I mean? And it was like, they never told us there were artists in the plane. You know, they told us there were walkers in the plane. It's like, okay. So the organizers okay. told 50 Cent at the school yeah. that there were the no artists. artists are not artists. Yes, that they, they were artists. workers who basically just wanted to follow the... Right. It's like, they finally opened the door and they said everybody should get down. So I came down and the uh, Nigerian bureau's organizers, the chairman, Chief Odumegu, right. he walked up to me and was like, Idris, we're sorry, it was our fault that we didn't do the necessity and all that. But 50 Cent asked you to come and have a handshake so we can mm -hmm. move to... I was like, no, yeah, man. I'm not doing that. Why did you feel strong like that? Even when what had because, because because from the beginning they knew exactly what they were doing. And for me, that was a revolution. Mm. That was a fight to rescue my people from slavery. I know it was gonna affect my career, but I'm gonna be here for the rest of my life. Mm. And I have to take that risk for Africa. Stop treating us like animals. Mm. We have talent, we have content. We are just like the Americans. The reason why Americans are what they are is because their leaders created a beautiful platform for them. Mm -hmm. From the politicians to the multinationals to everybody in different platforms. So it is our own responsibility to do the same for ourselves. So it's been 20 years since that time. The music industry has experienced an explosion like none other. That's right. You are older now, right? You are not as active as, say, where, you know, you're, you're hitting your prime. But do you feel a sense of betrayal looking back now, like, people that are benefiting now don't understand what I had to give up. And at the time, were there active people that were trying to blacklist you? Oh, you, of course. For me, it was a revolution. You thought of it like, I'm going to do this for... For a cause? Yes. Or you just wanted to make a statement right now? No, no for, for a cause. Right. For Nigerian artists to be respected and to be paid very well. Mm -hmm. And it finally happened. Without that revolution, there wouldn't have been the Bonner Boy, the video. They wouldn't have been benefiting whatever it is that they are benefiting so does, now. does it offend you? Does it hurt you? Do you feel betrayed when these stars now look at their own personal stories and how they've been successful and go like, Nobody paved the way. Oh, because they are selfish. Because they've never gone through a time before in their life. They never knew what it took Baba Kekeke Ogunbe to give us platform at that time when everybody was saying that no rap music or half rap music will never be what it is. That no. Let's go back to the studio and record Juju music. Go back to the studio, record Fuji music. Where are you from? Go back and sing your dialect. But this was a beautiful new song it was Afro hip hop, which is called Afro Beat today. There's a tendency for people to be fixated on Idris, yeah, what Idris is saying, how Idris is sounding, or oh, Idris 40 50 cent, or oh, Idris did Nigeria Jaga Jaga. To me, I think it removes sometimes from the quality work that you've done. Right? And we're talking about with the remedies with you as a solo artist. Do you look back on your discography and wish it was produced at a different time? Are you happy with what you were able to do for yourself with Eddie, with Kenny Music, and with Lacrim and every other thing that you've done? Do you think you came at the right time? Or would you have preferred to have come like now that it's easier to make music and easier to I came at the right time. If I didn't come at the right time, I wouldn't have revolutionized the industry. Today, there wouldn't have been what we have today. That's how you feel? Oh, yes. The point is that it was 21 years ago that I sang Nigeria Jaga Jaga. And it took Nigerians 21 years to understand the meaning of Jaga Jaga because they have started feeling the heat. Nigerians forget easily. But now, you know, they hit everybody. Now, now people, before, they dance to the beats, but now they listen to the lyrics like, oh, okay, this is what Idris was saying 21 years ago. Even Obasanjo himself has become the chief campaigner of Jaga Jaga today. He said, my papa and my mama Jaga Jaga, but funny enough, he's my father. 
So Obasanjo is the real Jaga Jaga. It's the problem of Nigeria. It's the one that put us to where we are today. Thank God I've been vindicated. You feel like you've been Oh, vindicated. vindication sweet me. During Good Luck Jonathan, Fuel was 180 Naira. Buhari came and took it to 350. Tinubu came and skyrocketed to what? 700 Naira. During Good Luck Jonathan, dollar was 189. Buhari came and took it to 320. Tinubu came, skyrocketed it to 1,200. So for you, how much yeah. is spaghetti during Good Luck Jonathan? It was 60,000, 60 naira. During Buhari, became 130 naira. Now, spaghetti is 800 naira. That's 200 percent. Improvised Nigerians, you know, doing everything possible to make people go crazy and sad. So, if you hate the truth, you it's because you are eating from the government. Let's say you don't talk where you you eat. Of course, that is the principle. So, for you, is are you content to be the? I mean, there's a song that you, you mentioned um, that Sufis at the time did a song that said he wanted to be like uh, Obasanjo. But me, I won't be like Ella and Nicola. Why do you want to be like Obasanjo? Somebody that sent somebody to kill and wiped out the old OD. I mean, I'm sure that was talking in a certain context. It, uh, does, it doesn't matter. You have to take your time to know exactly what you are talking about to want to be like somebody. But you want to be like Fela. It most definitely. With all of the criticism that Fela had. Most definitely. It's not a problem for you. Oh, no, most definitely. Because I know they lied against him. Which one of them again? Which lie did they like? Not today. That he had eight when we know they killed him. That's how you feel about Please, it. guy. Watch out for the documentary. Idris is coming to expose a lot of things to you guys. Dede Mabiaku will tell you much about Fela and Nikola Kokuti. Bro, it's a saddening situation we find ourselves in this country. Immediately, you are a person that speaks the truth. Just know that you are the enemy of the state. They will create lies on your head. But who gives a damn when God loves you for speaking the truth? I'm an ambassador to God. I am satisfied. I am happy. Know where you go. That they play Nigeria, you won't see everybody stand up and start dancing. People are feeling the heat. Jaga Jaga will stop raining the day Nigeria becomes a great country. Nobody can accuse Idris Abu Karim of not saying his mind, right? Whatever, either in song, either through your social media, you say it's how you feel it. Do you feel like that often makes people want to stay away, like, nah, Idris on too much, or you don't care, once you get your truth off, Anybody that hates the truth is the enemy of the state. Funny enough, most of the enemy of the state are part of the state. You can imagine that after DJT recorded everything that happened, Charlie Boy was the P-Man president at that time. And he came to the airport and his responsibility was to take that off and fight for the artists. But he went behind and collected money from Nigerian breweries to blacklist me. Do you know that for a fact? Or are you, ki are you kidding me? You know that for a fact. Are you kidding me? Where is the tape? Ask Mr. The DJT. Ask now. DJT will tell you that the tape is with Charlie Boy. So he used it to negotiate. Hey, oh, God, where is he? Now today we're there for Nigeria. Where we don't know what's in the apple. I say it all the time. It's all over the internet. I'm not scared to say my truth. There's a lot of truth that I haven't even said. Because I'm waiting for the right time to say those things. So I'm coming up with documentary very, very soon to expose a lot of things. It, you know. It's interesting that you mentioned that there's a documentary in the world. So typically, it appears like for the last 20 to 25 years of Afrobeats, there hasn't been much storytelling, deliberate curation of this period. You know, That's you right. I count how many people have done books. That's right. You know, I've done two books. That's right. Right. There's been only two documentaries. And you have all of these 
icons and legends that are growing old by the day. How do you think that we as Nigerians should invest our time and resources into curating the stories for history and then for posterity? Yes, most times you flash back and get to understand that uh, even in our schools today, history has been taken off the curriculum because it was intentional for a lot of people not to understand their history in order not to stand up and fight for it. How would you do that to your citizens? How would you do that to your own citizens? Just because of the bad things that you have done, you don't want Nigerians to know, so they don't wake up and revolutionize against you tomorrow. Right. So my advice for individual is never lie to yourself. Stand up, appreciate yourself, unite, forget about religion and tribal sentiment. Unite in any group that you are, in any platform that you represent, in any government that you represent, stand up and know your right and fight for your right. Invest also in your right. Invest in everything that you all do. Unite together and speak in one voice. If not... Is this something that you are looking at doing yourself? Because you have a very strong voice, you have stronger convictions. Why don't we put it to things that can put you in a position to act on the things that you are convinced of? Oh, most definitely. Yeah, I will, will at the right time. Right. If your music has no content, then the lifespan of that music is three months. You have to go back to the studio to record a stupid, another stupid music. I think what? And you go back again after three months, after that one, don't rain finish, to record. But Jaga Jaga is still rain. Mr. Lecturer, BBC had to send Kiki to go into the campus to find out if it was true that lecturers were actually harassing the girls. But you saw what happened. You saw the fact. Lecturers were caught rather than right. and this was harassing what girls. About. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jack Jagaga in itself, you know, I know that he was inspired by certain things, but was it you rebelling against, you know, leadership at the time? Was it you being, like Jesus said, the ghetto reporter, just reporting what's happening on the streets? But was that how you felt about the country of your birth, you know, that has given you everything? Do you feel, or did you feel at the time that it was Jaga Jaga? So let me tell the world that it's Jaga Jaga. Or was there a bigger message that you tried to pass across the world? I was nominated to raise the Olympic torch alongside with Professor Patu Tomi, right. Dora Kinyu, Lee Late, may I so rest in peace. May you continue to rest in peace, mommy, we love you. Larry Izamuje, Shegun Odigbami, and a few other people, you know. Now, time now to go on to KK, live at the airport as he welcomes back Nigeria's contingent from carrying the Olympic torch. But for the Olympics is right around the corner, and we have some Nigerians that represented Nigeria in Cairo, making things happen for Nigeria. Because this is the first time Nigerians are participating in Olympic torch relay, and the very first time the torch is touching base on Africa. Let's check out Idris Abdukarim, Nigerian music legend. Tell the young people the feeling. It's good, you know what I'm saying? What I just want to say is whatever you want to do, keep your head up, don't let no one bring you down. You can actually achieve anything you want to achieve. And we got to Egypt and we are all together in the same hotel. A late Dora Kennedy was like, my son, how did you get here? I said, Mr. Lecturer got me here. He said, oh, Mr. Lecturer. He said, oh, wait a minute. The song, Mr. Lecturer. I said, yes. I said, oh, wow, wow. Wow, people are observing things. People are observing situation. This is huge. Please put up more songs like that out there. Don't be scared of anybody. Make sure you speak the truth, whether anybody likes it or not. And this was, you know... During lunch. Yeah, speaking this to you. Yeah. And Professor Patutomi said the same thing to me and encouraged me. Same thing with Shegwan Digbami. You know, we grew up in Kano together, right. you know. And it was like, oh, I'm very proud of you. So the next day, while the torch, you know, person who started, mm. you know, Professor Patutumi, from 20 meter, collected yeah, the, torch, the torch and it ran towards me. And I was so emotional that day. He was crying. I knew he started crying from the moment he got it. I didn't know what was going through his mind. Mm. I couldn't tell. But when he got to me, I saw that he has been crying. And he passed the thought to me and he said, my son, I'm passing my generation to your generation. Bro, 
That's are you, what, are, you are, are you kidding me? That's a heavy statement. It's automatically telling me that I'm giving you an authority to go and speak on behalf of Nigerians. That is your feed as a musician. So you can change the country with your music and speak the truth, whether anybody likes it or not. And I was like, wow. I cried. I couldn't help it. So I ran and, you know, dropped my, you know, touch to the next mm. person, which is from another country, mm. you know. And I went back to the hotel that day. I went to take my shower. Then I did my ablution and I did, did my salat. If I want to talk to my God, I have to do my salat and my prayers and say, yo, God, I want to go into fasting. This is what I want to do. Please show me the way. Tell me what to do. So I started the fasting the next day. And after seven days, we got back to Lagos. I slept. And the word was Nigeria, Jaga, Jaga. That's how you heard it? Oh, yes. And I stood up immediately, picked up my phone. Nice. Nigeria, Jaga, Jaga. Nigeria, Jaga, Jaga. And I look at Everything scatter, scatter. Poor man, they suffer, suffer. Busa, busa. Gunshot in the air. And immediately, I called Soso. I called Chris Okoro. And we hit the studio. Right. And I recorded Nigeria, Jaga, Jaga. You heard of Basson just said, you see this chair? It's over my dead body. That's how Obasan just encouraged gangsterism in politics. That is how he encouraged corruption in politics. Today, it has evolved all over politicians. There are people from your era, some people that you are friendly with. Yes. Um, the late great Steve the said Kadari. Yeah. Um, the late OJB. Yeah. Had these issues. Yeah. Do you feel sometimes like why am I here? Do you feel like, why didn't they get the same blessing that I got in surviving this? I feel like we need more information. If we had more information back then, a lot of people wouldn't have died, you know, on this kidney issue. Like, for example, some people travel to India to get this transplant done. And then they give them medication that they will use for one year without medical checkup every month to know how the kidney is doing, to check your criterion, to see what's going on, you know, to get your uh, taculimus test done, to see how your kidney is doing, and then wait for one year for the medication to be done, then order for another medication without regular yeah. checkup. Right. That's why you see most people that go to India, mm. they just die, right. you know? Right. but. Sweetest thing that ever happened to me was that I have someone like Dr. Bamboi. You know, I did a song, I dedicated, I mm. called his name. I did a song to my yeah. to, to appreciate my wife. Yeah. And I called in his, his name. Dr. Bamboi is such we are, Nigerians are so gifted. Right. Nigerians are so gifted, we just have bad leadership. That means, like when I said, we go here and we Oh no, plenty of things. For 2024, you go year story. They go year fire. Now, they, they go year because I know God intentionally protect my life and give me this opportunity for me to do a lot of things. I still have a lot of work to do. If not, maybe I would have gone. I know he loves me so much. For me, in my dream, God called me his political activist. That's why he called me political activist. My political activist. I am determined to follow. Oh, yes. My responsibility is to speak the truth. Only truth will set our country free, right. whether anybody likes it or not. Right. So I have to appreciate Nigerians all over the world in diaspora for their prayers and support. I appreciate my wife, Sekinat, Yetunde. I love you so much. You know, may Allah continue to bless you. I appreciate my wife and my children. I appreciate Kenny Ogunbe. Right. You know, I appreciate Chief Allen Oyema. You know, I appreciate my brother Imoni. You know, that's when you know who are your friends. You know, that came out to show you love and support you. You know what I mean? 
And also appreciate Dr. Bamboi. May you live long. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I mean, since after my surgery, approximately 12 transplants has been carried out. People come from Canada to come to Nigeria to come and... That's amazing. Do you understand? That's amazing. So imagine if we have great leadership and we have great hospitals and yeah. equipment, people will come all over the world. You burst on the scene at a time that Nigerian music, as we know it, wasn't the way it was, right? At the time that you came out, all of the international major record companies had come and gone. The Nigerian music industry was without form at this point. But well, that's the era that you came out in. I've, I've, I've written about you. I've you know, done quite some, some, some stuff. And I know how you came from Kano to Lagos. You know, in just a brief words, how, now that you're looking back, how do you make that connection? You were doing okay in Kano, living a normal young star life, but you wanted to do music, and you headed to Lagos. Not that somebody said, hey, just come and stay with me. Not that you had a friend that you were writing to. How did you make that connection from Kano to Lagos, and then eventually to Kenny Ogunbe, even before it became Kenny's music? God, revolution, revelation. In my dream, God kept telling me, you're called. People say that they hear from God, you know. It's for real. Like that. It's for real. Because oh, I don't hear I, literally like I, that. Yes. I get my message from God through my dreams. And when he said, it's time, it's time. And he tell me what to do. And I go to the studio. I do it. I just explained to you how Jaga Jaga came up. Right. Same way Mr. Lecture came up. Same. I was in Kano in 1995. Okay. You know, looking forward to people like Dr. Fresh. I know you must have heard yeah, of Dr. Fresh. Dr. Fresh. Yeah. Music in the north was big hip than the hip south. Hip hip huge. Oh, oh yes, mm -hmm. you know, hip hop was alias in the in the north. Yeah. So so Dr. Fresh was just the biggest star in Kano at that time. There's no shows in Central Hotel, any part of the north that Dr. Fresh doesn't go and shut down. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was still in military school then. Hamid Day, Bukavu Barak. I have a couple of friends that I met in school who were basically into music, but I've never seen them, you know, perform mm. before. You know, so one day, my agricultural teacher was like, there's an event going on at the Soldiers Club today, you know, so that should just come around and watch before I go to the house. So I got to the Soldiers Club, and that was the first time I was like, I was alone and I was shocked like really so people rapping mm -hmm. you know people miming doing their thing and I was like wow funny enough at that time I'd already I was already representing Kano State in fact I represented Nigeria as a table tennis player I played ping pong I represented Kano as a cadet player you know alongside with you know Yinkama Jekodumi Taufik Maya, Funke Oshinaike, Biola Odumo, so, oh yes. So, but for me, immediately I mm. got to yeah, experience, experience music. music. Yeah. I just went for music. Oh, wow. I knew it was my call. Mm. I knew it was my call. I knew this is it. I was looking for an opportunity, an avenue to express myself and speak for the voice of the voiceless. Mm you know, to speak for the people who can speak for themselves. So after that day, I invited a couple of them to come to the house. My mom lives at Sabongeri. You know, she sells pepper soup. So they come and eat. Then I'll ask them questions. How do you do this? There's been certain health challenges that you've had that some of the people that you were close to, that you knew, had. You know, and you know, how how did that make you feel? First, how did you know that you were ill? Was there specific symptoms that you had at the time that you felt like this is not right? And then that's just in brief. In 2012, I went for an event. I know how energetic I am when I'm performing. Then I noticed that I noticed something wasn't right at the side of my tummy. So I. It was a beautiful performance, killed the crowd that I managed to perform. I went back home, I told my wife, 
went to the hospital as they to go and do check up. When I got to the hospital, the doctor was like, um, my kidney is very weak. You need to give me some medication, you know. So he gave me a couple of medications. Ending of 2022, started feeling the pain more after performances. January 2023, I told my wife, I we need to go to, um, what's it called? We need to go and see a doctor, a specialist that I was told about. Somewhere around Ikeja GRA. So went there and did all tests. And he said, my kidney is failing. That I need to start the dialysis. You know, told me everything and put me through everything. I agreed to start my dialysis. There was a few friends of my wife that had the same mm -hmm. issue. Right. And my wife called them and reached out to them and I was like, what's up? What's, mm -hmm. you know, what's, how did he go about it, you know? I was like, ah, no, 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 that we should leave that hospital and book an appointment with Dr. Bamboe at St. Nicholas Hospital. Immediately, the next day, we got an appointment with Dr. Bamboy. Went to see Dr. Bamboy. A man, a man is an angel, man. You know, so went to see Dr. Bamboy, and Dr. Bamboy was like, Hi, Idris, how are you? I love your music. I love the fact that you speak the truth. You know, we appreciate people. You're not just, you're not just, just a regular patient. Regular patient. So I'm interested mm. in your case. So go to the lab and let them get all these tests done for you. Then we'll take it up from there. So went to the lab and they did all the tests and it was like, okay, so Idris, here is the point. Your kidney mm. has failed. As it is now. Now, you're on stage four. Wow. So you need a transplant. With a transplant, you're gonna live your life again like a newborn baby. And I was like, so, how do I get a mm. transplant? How do I get a kidney? Does the hospital, no. uh, you know, it was like, yeah. no. That if that happens, that would be like we're trafficking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. organs and all that. Yeah. Say, so what we do basically is we take from family members, your children, your brother, your friends, then right there, my wife was like, can I donate for him? We never talked about it, I didn't know. It was like, can I donate for him? And doctor was like, yes, if you are compatible. And she was like, how do I know that I'm compatible? Said, you have to go through a couple of tests. Said, can I start now? Doctor was like, yes. So she went to the lab. She did about 15 different tests. And to God be the glory, she was compatible with me. And I'll say that, um, I should get ready next month. The surgeon will be coming in from America and India. He wasn't up to a week. We got a call that the surgeons are around. You guys should check in today. You know, this was October last year. So we told our children about it. So they prayed, they were crying, but they prayed, you know. So we got to the hospital. We told them that they should, I, when Dr. Bamboe told me it was transplant plan, I knew I was going to make it. I, and I knew that people love me out there. Mm. I know mm. people that love me genuinely mm. for what I stand for, for what I speak for. Not for playing music, right. but for what I stand for. So when my wife now said what she said and we're compatible, I was very happy. So, so my dialysis wasn't even up to four months. We, we were checked in to the hospital and um, my children went home. And the India woman came and were like, Abdul, how are you? I'm fine, you know, say so, Abdul. Um, this is where I'm going to be putting your new kidney tomorrow and uh, just relax. It's a regular thing that I do. Don't worry. 
you know, I checked all your tests and I found out that your, your, uh, your body, spirit and soul are in good spirit to go. And I'm happy for that. So everything is going to be fine. You know, just relax yourself. Okay. I say, yes, doc. Thank you very much. So around eight o'clock in the morning, I came to take my wife to the, mm. you know, theater. And when it was nine o'clock, they came back for me and went to the theater. And as soon as they lay me down on the bed, it wasn't up to one minute. Took off. I was gone. And um, five hours later, it was pain. That woke you up. That woke me up. Mm. So much pain. And I was like, I want water. I want to drink water. And in India, I was like, Idris, this is 6 p.m. Prepare yourself and relax yourself. You're going to take water by 7 a.m. I was like, ah, <laughs> God, 7 a.m., long, long. So I was like, where's my wife? Mm. You know, where's my wife? Like, don't worry, your wife is in the nest. I see you. She's fine. And everything is okay with her, you know. So I started praying. Mm. And the doctor was like, congratulations. It was successful. perfect. It was okay. Congratulations. I was like, I want to see my wife. Mm. You know, because they've done her since. Yeah. So she was okay. She was just smiling. Yeah. I was like, hey, what's up? She see me at the cry, they shout, you know. Say, She's fine. Don't no worry. Like, how am I? I say, I'm very, very fine. You know. And she was like, we thank God. Like, then she should go back and rest. So she went. So I was in the hospital, in the ICU for eight days, you know. Then the pain started so reducing, subsiding. Then they moved us from the ICU to the, in the ward, you know. So came to check us all for another seven days. Give us medi gave me my medication. And after 15 days, I was discharged go back home, show me my medication. In fact, funny enough, I was surprised. When it was seven o'clock, they brought water for me, I drank. And when it was eight o'clock, they brought beans, plantain, oh, wow. and, and beef. And you ate it. And I was telling the doctor that, no, doctor said I should not eat beans. I should not eat. He said, no, you're a new person now. Mm. Go ahead, eat. I was like, what? Oh, wow. Like, seriously? Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's an amazing It's thing. like, seriously? Yeah. He said, yes. I was like, oh, God, I give you the glory. <laughs> Thank you. I saw a few comments, and one stood out to me. And somebody said, who doesn't know you, by the way? Just said, uh, look at him, a typical Nigerian man. If it was his wife that needed the kidney, he would not have given it. I would do the same because she is a godsend. From the day that I met her, right. and my mom saw her, she's a godsend. I would have done the same. I mean, who, which woman will give a husband a kidney if the man mm, is not right. a good man? That's a good it's point. not possible. That's a good point. The woman will not go. Who? That's a if you are a bad man, no woman will want to give you a, a kidney. And everybody that knows me know that I love my wife so, so much. Mm -hmm. And I don't joke with family. I love family. Nobody's perfect, actually. Mm -hmm. But I don't joke with family. I love my wife so much. Right. So if I was in a position, I would have done the same thing. There are people from your era, some people that you are friendly with. Yes. Um, the late great Steve, the late Kadari. Yeah. Um, the late OJB. Yeah. They had these issues. Yeah. Do you feel sometimes like, why am I here? Do you feel like, why didn't they get the same blessing that I got in surviving this? I thought of it. But, you know, I feel like we need more information. If we had more information back then, a lot of people wouldn't have died. 
you know, on this kidney issue. Like, for example, some people travel to India to get this transplant done. And then they give them medication that they will use for one year without medical checkup every month. That's why you see most people that go to India, mm. they just die. Right. Sweetest thing that ever happened to me was that I have someone like Dr. Bamboi. You know, I did a song, I dedicated, I mm. called his name. I did a song to, my, yeah. to, to appreciate my wife yeah. and I called his, his name. Dr. Bamboi is such, well, Nigerians are so gifted. Nigerians are so gifted, we just have bad leadership. I told one of my friends that, listen, man, I'd like to go and perform at Train 2, which is the regular place where we perform at Central Hotel in Kanu. And they were like, oh, oh, that's beautiful, why not? So that day, Dr. Fresh was performing, and I went there and uh, I was invited to come and perform. So that day, I experienced the first politics. I was invited, I grabbed the microphone and I asked the DJ to play my instrument. I immediately started playing the instrument and I started rapping. They removed the wire and they made it look like it was my fault. I got off the stage in the next six minutes. The music is back and everything. everything and Dr. Fresh came on stage and performed and everything. Oh, no, okay. The guy called me, he said, that's the politics. I was like, oh, really? I said, oh, okay. So next time, while I was going back there, I took my DJ along with me. Oh, so you already had a DJ? Oh, I took my DJ along with me and performed my song, and everything was okay. And I killed the crowd. Mm. And since that day, I became a competitor to Dr. Fresh. Right. Chased him out of Kanu. And he went to Abuja. Went to Abuja. Head is in Abuja. I went to Abuja, chased him out of Abuja, came to Lagos. I heard he was in Lagos. That's when I took the 911 bus I was bringing tomato and pepper and came oh, so to So you didn't come to Lagos in the luxurious bus? No, luxurious bus. Okay. I want to turn tata at the, at the tomato. Mm. That's how you got to Lagos to chase your dream? That's right. Couldn't go to family's house. I had mm. to stay under the bridge. Then... Mm. Head down. It was for like nine months, though. And I'm thinking about it. How I survived. Yes. I wake up every morning. The old up is piling up. Mm. And I walk through any car that has that is an undercar. I know it's an Ausa car. Ausa road. They, they are, oh, that's true. That's their favorite car. They don't like any other car than under. Right. So... The wind down, I just start rapping. Na how mota, to ina malanza maje kana wanda bu na mukapara kano takare ko de make zo ampika na je kura de chiro mawa na ibawa arna sarawa man shiga city jamahati ti sekeche seka ke sabo akwana atashi na gan dunia na iso na ge de gide ane kano city. So the guy, they will just start rap laughing. Oh, wow. They will just start laughing like hey. <laughs> What's your name? Idris, Idris. Ah, I like you, I like you, I like you, I like you. Yeah, let me give you something. Here's my number. If you need anything, call me. That's how I lived. And those contacts from that time to today, which then I made it, I still keep those contacts. Been, we could have done this for another three hours. Thank you, Taiwo. I imagine. Thank you, Taiwo. Thank Thank you, you